Shopping for bargains has become a national obsession. Clothes have never been more disposable. We get that kind of buzz of like, oh, I got a bargain. But would our passion for throwaway fashion be so strong if we knew how the clothes were really made? It doesn't really affect me if it's been made by a three-year-old or a 50-year-old. To find out, six fashion fanatics have swapped shopping for India to make clothes for the British high street. Amongst them are Adman Richard McIntyre. They've called them, you know, sweatshops and they've said it is child labour, but I'd quite like to sort of you know, get my own opinion of it. Aspiring fashion designer Tara Scott. You can know that something's going on, but if you haven't seen it, then it's almost like, like, is it real? Like, which truth do you believe? And shop assistant Stacey Dooley. I don't give it any thought. India's so far away, I don't really think. Last week, our six Brits started at the top, learning to make clothes for some of the biggest names on the UK high street. This business is serious business, no fun. But the pressure proved too much for some. Everything is just piling up and you just snap. This is too stressful for me. Oh. Now the Brits are being thrown in at the deep end to work in the unregulated backstreet factories. This place is my idea of hell. This is not the fashion industry. For these six Brits, things can only get tougher. Excuse me, guys. Oh, please. Oh. Fresh yourself up and back to work. I'm up for just not even giving a shit about hygiene and just getting out of here as fast as possible. But can they stay the course? People here bosh out stuff every day and they get 12 rupees for each one. It just seems really, really unfair. I don't think it's that bad for them. I mean, it's horrific for us. Or will life at the cutting edge of the fashion business rip them apart at the seams? I don't want to be here for another minute. You shithole. It's gone way too far. <laughs> this week, our six Brits are in West Delhi. It's a frenetic suburb of the Indian capital with dirt track roads and countless backstreet workshops. Oh, oh, that is wrong. <laughs> the group will be working at Stylecraft, a company that makes cheap clothes for export to UK wholesalers. Oh my god. Oh my god. Their factory is tucked away down a narrow alley beside a cow shed. Heading up Stylecraft is Mr. Aurora. Yes, dear. I'm Vinod Aurora. Uh... He's had an order from a London wholesaler for 2,000 blouses and has agreed to let our Brits work on part of the consignment. That's what we have to make? Yes, yes. You will have to do everything from start to finish, each garment. It is not that you will have to stitch only one part. You will have to start the garment and finish it. If we make a perfect piece, how much do you pay for each piece? 12 rupees for one piece will be you. That's like less than 10p. Normally our tailor makes about 20 pieces a day of this style. I hope you'll be able to make at least six. So you're talking about six garments each or six between the six of us? No, six garments each. Uh-oh! 36 garments. You'll be required to do 36 garments. Oh, God. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. When can we start? You can start right away. The group won't be stitching the blouses here. Mr. Aurora subcontracts the sewing to workshops dotted around the area. Where do we go? As the Brits head off to their new workplace, it's clear Richard isn't happy with his new surroundings. Oh, how fucking difficult is it to stick all your rubbish in like a big tip or something? Now, do me a fucking favour. They're just filth mongers. This is a fucking disgrace. Richard McIntyre, 24, grew up on a council estate in Peterborough, but now runs his own advertising company. He believes that just like him, anyone can make a success of themselves. I believe that uh, people that are in extreme poverty, sort of all, all throughout the world, that they do have an opportunity to do something about it. I think Richard sees things in black and white. He doesn't sort of take into consideration that sometimes it's not easy to actually better yourself. He came to India to get a clearer picture of the reality of the Indian garment industry. 
they've called them you know sweatshops and they've said it, it's child labor but i'd quite like to sort of see it with my own eyes and decide what i believe really he started off thinking the work was easy i mean you could train a monkey to do it if i was being perfectly serious but he failed at both sewing and ironing look what did i fail on i don't get it and ended up being demoted to the lowest job in the factory doing up buttons now, Richard's living amongst some of the poorest workers in Delhi, and he's not impressed. Oh, that is just fucking disgusting. I thought I was going to see India. All I've seen is a fucking swamp. <laughs> the place is a fucking shithole. The workshop our six will be working in this week is typical of the small factories in the surrounding area. The tailors are here 24-7. They work 15 or more hours a day, then grab sleep underneath their machines. They will find a lot of hardships. Sometimes there is no electricity, and they only save one or two bathrooms for 20 workers. Deadlines are very stressful, basically. This is how I imagined a sweatshop to be. Um, just dirty, smelly, disgusting. It's just absolutely horrible. We haven't got any toilets. It's got no toilet roll. We haven't got even a shower. It's dirty and it smells really bad. This place is my idea of hell. Georgina might think it's hell, but this is the reality of how many high street clothes are made. Our six Brits will work under the watchful eye of Rahman, one of the owners. Check the measurement chart, bottom, front, back, armholes. Yep. Last week, the group were only sewing one part of each garment. Here they will have to stitch the entire blouse from scratch, a far harder challenge. At least it's all right, because it looks awful to me. Oh, a big mistake. That's outside, this is inside. This is wrong. This is down, okay? Ah, uh, get it. Get so it? I've got to put this in there, yeah? Okay. Because it's quite a stretchy material. It's really quite difficult to sort of sew it straight. You would never imagine how difficult it is. They're so clever, the sewers. Oh, God. I am really rubbish. Profit margins for subcontractors like Rahman can be tight. As little as 40 rupees or 50 pence an item. Shoulders, chest. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Rahman needs to get the Brits up to speed quickly if he's to make a decent profit. I mean, I'm not enjoying it. It's not what I want to do at all. I mean, I, I don't have, find any amusement or fun um, in stitching some fabric together. Um, the whole sort of reason for me doing this was not because I. Uh, I wanted to stitch a top together, it was to learn how it's done and there's a huge difference between learning how something's done and actually wanting to do it. Everyone's got the um, no one wants to be here today because they're saying they're bored and stuff. But, um, you know, this is what they do. This is, their, this is the way that they, um, they work and stuff, you know. Our Brits haven't yet completed a single one of their 36 blouses they decide to take a break. The place we're working is not really nice at all. Yeah, it's a bit like a sweatshop kind of thing. It is. It's just, it's just like a room with sewing machines. I think the, uh, the place is obviously a complete and utter shithole. I mean, the accommodation is not going to be what we're used to because we're in a completely different society, but I don't think it's that, that bad for them. I mean, it's fucking horrific for us. Break over, it's back to work. And finally, the group's efforts start to pay off. That's cool. It's right. And after a few hours, even Georgina, the worst sewer last week, seems to be getting the hang of it. I'm quite impressed with myself. This is the first time. I've ever made a proper garment. It's the first time I've ever made a proper garment. My mum will be impressed with me. 
think um, I'm getting along pretty well actually. I'm quite enjoying this one. Um, I've almost finished my first piece. This is okay? Okay. Yes. I've finished one. Thank you very much. Each Brit needs to produce six garments over the next three days. But a typical worker produces 20 garments a day to earn a livable wage of 200 rupees or £2.50. I've done five now. And this one, I'm not even kidding you, it's perfect. With the team pleased with their progress, Tara goes to see Mr Aurora to show him some of the 15 blouses that they've stitched so far. Tara, 21, wants to be a fashion designer, just like her mum. My mum designs a concession range at Topshop um, called Tara Starlet, which she named after me, which is really girly, lovely, pretty dresses. She thinks that working in the Indian garment industry will give her a head start in her career. I really look forward to learning more skills because when I leave university, that's why I want to go into full-time business with my mum. I expect her to come back as a really experienced machinist and then she could come and work like mad for me. Last week, she would have made her mum proud, despite finding it tough at the start. This is too stressful for me. She ended up being so good, she was even offered a job. I'm very happy with your hard work also. And I'm very happy with your positive thinking. These are my bundles. Now it's time to find out if she can impress Mr. Aurora and his daughter Smriti. Can I have okay. yours? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the seam is ripping. Uh -uh. Seam is ripping here. Oh, yes. There's no seam. This is Richard's. In Richard's piece, the back is medium and the front is of small size. He's mixed two components of two different sizes. And one sleeve is medium, one size, one side sleeve is small. That is why one side is not. Small. That means there's going to be another one somewhere, isn't there? With yes, the other yes, one. Yes, yes. Another one somewhere one. with somebody. The rest of the team yeah. don't fare any better. The garment is not correct. It is twisting here. It is twisting here. It is twisting here. The left do you want seat. her to unpick it and start again, or do you want her yes, to just? She'll have to okay. do that. This one is completely gone. <coughs> it is attached completely wrong. Completely wrong. She has to redo it. She has to do it. This garment is actually spoiled. Rejected. Okay. Every single garment has been rejected. I don't mind giving you more time, but bring the correct pieces. All right then, thank you. Okay. The garments may be cheap to produce, but they have to be top quality to make it onto the UK high street. The quality isn't quite good enough. The ones that I've still got here need to be corrected. So I don't know, I'm hoping that people won't be disheartened by that news um, and I hope that they take, um, they take it all right and that the pieces that are waiting now are of a better standard because otherwise we're all going to have to redo everything, which is not going to be fun. Of course they have done it very badly, but they didn't expect it. This, this fabric is not an easy fabric to handle. And now I have explained to her what is wrong. I hope she, she, she will be able to get it done. Tara arrives back at the factory to relay the bad news to the group. Hi, guys. Hi, Tim. Hi, guys. How's it going? How's it been? So how many have we done? So far, we haven't got any that are actually passable. Um, how many did you take over there? Took over five, and I've come back with three, which all need to be altered. So, um, yeah. Having heard they haven't completed a single blouse, Boss Rahman is back to make sure that they pick up the pace. You guys, what's going on? You need to finish all the garments, so you carry on. Yeah. Okay? We if can, if, we, yeah. if you want to work, you can work whole night. Yeah. Or if you want to get rest, you can sleep. Okay. Okay, boys will sleep here with my boys, with my workers, and girls will sleep inside the room. Okay. The boys will just sleep on his desk. Yes, yeah. No, not on desk. We will provide you the bedding. Where do we sleep? Just on the floor, really? Floor, yeah. Oh my god. I just sleep on the floor. The Indian workers sleep on this floor every night, but Richard doesn't fancy spending even one here. Rather than actually have an early night now, sleep with the rats and the ants and the stench. 
I prefer just working right through the night, just getting it done and then just getting out of it. With the plan set to sew through the night, the Brits head off to find dinner. Everyone, including Richard, knew that coming to India would involve living as an Indian worker. But after their total failure today, the prospect of spending any more time in the factory seems to have become too much for him. This just isn't me at all. It's not me. I don't want to do this. I really don't want to do it. I just shouldn't be here. It's just completely not me because it just infuriates me. What we're here for is to, is to learn about how our clothes are made. And I think that they could have done it a bit I'm not here. I don't give a fuck how my clothes are made. It doesn't take a genius to work out that actually someone sews it somewhere. <laughs> Actually, so far, all they've done is show me a poor shithole people that haven't got the intellect to spell their own names, let alone hold a conversation with me. I'm not going to come over here and just because they're Indian and I live in a Western world and people are going to say, oh, you're just rich and you've got this and you've got all these advantages. Fuck off. Richard's offensive comments leave his co-workers speechless, but provokes one of the locals to speak out. I, I'm sorry, but you should not speak something negative to our country. Well, I wasn't speaking about your country. Pardon me? I wasn't talking about your country, I was talking about individuals, okay, regardless Maybe of it's nationality. Your perception. Regard no, it's not my perception. See. That is what we were talking about. You've heard half, a, half, half a conversation. It's a matter of your talk in your hotel room. I'm not a racist person. I wasn't not liking them because they're a different coloured skin to me okay. or because they're a different nationality. I was not liking them because I've made a judgment on their personality Fine. and I don't fucking like the people I've met. If something related to my own person, my own country, well, I would definitely, definitely... OK, well, that's it. fine, but was I talking about you? No. I am really... Was I referring to your country? No. So go away. Why? Why? You should also go away. I mean, I am not What's saying that. What? You're talking really? something negative to my country. I was simply saying that I've met some people just the same really? as you're entitled to meet me yeah. and go away later on and say, I think he was a dickhead. But you're not allowed to turn around and say, I think he was a dickhead because he's no, no, white and because I, he's English. This is, this okay. is my own personal feelings. That's well, the reason I've interrupted that's you. That's fine. I understand. But, uh, but okay. you should not feel anything bad about it. No, okay, that, that's like, perfectly like fine. Your okay. Please look Cheers. up here. What, what am I doing here? <coughs> Richard's sudden tirade has left everyone shell-shocked. I'm just exhausted now from that. That was just really scary. I just, I've never seen Richard react like that ever. And um, I was just a bit frightened, really. When uh, one person is talking abusive language with our nation, with our government, with our people, with our culture, I felt really bad about it. Maybe you have felt bad about certain people in India, but everybody is not like that. The Brits had hoped the meal tonight would be a chance for them to regroup, but instead it's thrown them completely off course. As they make their way back to the factory, Richard decides life at the cutting edge of the fashion business has become too much. I don't want to be here for another minute. It's a fucking shithole. It's making me feel... It's been physically sick because of the fucking stench. Richard's only been in India for 10 days, but it seems his adventure may be over. You going home? Hey, mate. Oh, I've got to go. I'm just, I'm, it's just everything's really, really irritating me. It's been a catastrophe. Yes. It's been an absolute horror show. Mm. I think that when we all sort of started this, everyone was sort of, you know, just really excited because everyone sort of, you know, really excited about doing this. You know, the novelty's worn off. We're 10 days in now. The novelty has worn off and it's all just spilled over. I think that it's gone way too far. Richard has had a really difficult um, couple of days. I think we're all going to come across really difficult challenges and I think this is Richard's challenge now. Later, Richard reflects on his negative view of the Indian workers he's met. I tend to sort of wear my heart on my sleeve in a sense that I'm, I'm a very honest person and if I don't think something's right, um, I, I will just tell you that. Um, and I think that it's, uh, it's not done me any favours. It's clear to me now that I have very different viewpoints to, uh, to, to other people with regards to this. You know, when I see people in, in, in poverty, the, the first thing that, that happens is it doesn't break my heart. I don't instantly feel sympathy for them. I don't want to drag them out of it. I question why they're in poverty and could they have done something about it themselves? Um, people may say that that's a, a, harsh, view, uh, a harsh view on stuff, but it, 
it's just just how I am. Every day that I'm here, it's just it's just getting on top of me more and more. Exhausted, emotionally drained, and little closer to their goal of 36 completed blouses than when they started, the group bed down amongst the workers for their first night on a factory floor. It's 8 a.m. the next morning, and workshop co-owner Praduman arrives to wake everyone up. This way, you guys. Good morning. It's time we get back to work. 30 minutes shop. It's freezing. It's just the starting of winters. Wait till it gets two degrees. We can't have a wash because of um, there's no sink. And there's no tap, and there's no shower. So my plan is just to get changed and use the baby wipes. I'm up for just not even giving a shit about hygiene for a few hours and just getting out of here as fast as possible. You have to do your shoes up when you go to the bathroom because the wee splashes on your feet. <laughs> I'd prefer to be somewhere where they had a shower and a nice bed because I hate camping, and to me, this is camping. Complaining about it's not going to do anything, is it? I might as well just embrace it and just get on with it and just do it, but it just can't be asked. <laughs> There's only two days left, and the team will have to work relentlessly if they are to hit their target of 36 blouses. But with last night's events hanging over them, no one is in the mood for sewing. It just really, really kicked off last night, big time. And I, Richard was so angry. Richard just says whatever he thinks. You know, just have a bit of respect and stuff. Because I think if I was in England, if I was in Nando's and someone was like, someone Indian or not English was like, I hate this country, it's disgusting, really shouting in, in a restaurant, I'd probably, I'd probably be a bit like, what are you doing here then? Go, go home. Last night, Richard was determined to quit, but in the cold light of day, he's having second thoughts. I don't really know what's best, to be honest. I just, uh, kind of feels like a bad dream, but I want to just wake up from it, but I know that it's not really like that, so... I'm not sure if, if I sort of just going home, whether I'm just being quite naive by thinking, OK, I can just go home and everything will just go away. Whereas I know it won't, you know, I'm sort of uh, part of this experience now and I'm not sure that I can just walk away from it. I'm not sure that that's the right thing to do. Confused about his future, he decides to consult the rest of the group. Obviously, you know, yesterday I was sort of said that I was uh, probably going to leave. Um, I just thought it'd be a good idea before, uh, before I go, or, you know, if I do decide to go in the end, if we just sort of had a pretty open sort of discussion. I know sometimes the way I express my views and stuff, I'm quite a passionate person yeah. in sort of everything that I do and in the way that I articulate that to, you know, sometimes not necessarily the best sort of way, but have I sort of uh, offended anybody with, with, you know, in my mannerisms when I've been expressing things or in anything that I've said? So. I've been offended on a couple of occasions. I just get offended when people are, like, aggressive or... If there's just like unnecessary aggro, like it, it kind of upsets me, it makes me uneasy and uncomfortable. Like sometimes, you know, you think really like you react and you know, you have this whole like sort of rant. And we all can rant and we have our opinion, but like, sometimes I'm frightened that you're gonna say something that might tarnish you as a person. Okay, but if that's my view, wouldn't you want me to express it? Of course, I want you to express it, but kind of like calm down before you kind of like go off into a bit where you say something that you might regret. You, you, you were frustrated. I get like that sometimes. You get bent up and it's almost like, you don't, where's your release going to come from? Yeah. We're, we're away from, we're back home at the moment. It's like certain things, as you were saying, like going to the gym, playing football, it's a release for us, you, you know, vent up anger. You, know, you, you get kind of stressed out in work and stuff like that. You use your social time to release your, your stresses, but we don't do that here. There's no, nothing for us to do. I think you, you realise deep down 
what bit was probably wrong with it or whatever, but you, you only learn from your mistakes. Yeah, I think that if we can just snap you out of being a bit negative and start being a bit positive, I think that it's going to completely, we'll, I think we'll just completely turn around and have a really good time. I think that's what I'm thinking more now, after sort of even just chatting to you guys now and think that, I said, I'm changing my mind somewhat in a sense that if I just went home now, I've only seen, you know, this much. And I think that actually I kind of owe it to, to myself, see a different side of it. With Richard deciding to stay, it's back to business as usual in the workshop. With 36 blouses to complete by tomorrow, everyone needs to put the events of last night behind them. The group makes steady progress, but things are going slowly. Suddenly, to add to their frustration, the entire electrical supply packs up. Work in the factory grinds to a halt. The power's gone, so the sewing machines aren't working because it's got no power. We've got to do 36 tops. Everyone's got the arm. It's not, it's not good. And to make matters worse for the Brits, Mr. Aurora's daughter has arrived for a spot check. Tara, can I have a word with you? Yes. Yesterday, she rejected every single blouse they'd stitched. She's keen to see if the blouses they've sewn since are an improvement. <laughs> I think this one's marked that's, because it's got the, it's got the um, binding in it. Things start off surprisingly well. Who's done the binding? You've done the binding on the shoulder? That was a very good effort, I have to say. Thank you very much. Actually, excellent effort. I would say A+. Plus. Oh, yes. I'm not even sure that's Mark's. Mark might have got an A+, plus, okay. but not everyone's work is up to the high standards demanded by her clients in the UK. OK, hear it. This has a little problem. His binding is stretched out. His edges are coming off. This should not be happening. And some of the sewing is even worse than yesterday. Both arms, both sleeves have to sit exactly identically. Mm. This garment has a problem with the armhole. The sleeves are getting puffy here. The armhole has actually gotten stretched. It is getting puffy all the way. Did you know that puffy arms are actually in at the moment? <laughs> yeah, puffy arms are not in from here. You stretch the sleeve a little. Yeah. Read with. All right. Mark, you've done a major problem. You've attached <laughs> the wrong side of the garment. Okay, now I understand that you people have completed seven garments among yourself. So that's another 29 to go. And I want to see good quality garments from you people. So a few people back to work. Thank you. It's been another frustrating inspection for the group. Mr. Aurora's daughter has just discarded <laughs> over half their new blouses. We've just had so many rejected that uh, like that whole part there was just stuff. Stuff rejected, which is probably about 20 different things. Just a bit frustrating. There's actually a lot of work to be done. Till now, there's not much progress. Only seven finished garments. By the end, uh, by the mid afternoon, there's not much work done. They actually have a lot of work to do to finish everything, and they have to get going fast. If they want to leave, they have to get going fast. Trapped in a vicious cycle of sewing and rejection. It's time to fire up the emergency generator and get back to the machines. The Brits have got 29 blouses still to stitch and just 24 hours to do it in. Here we go again. It's showing me how to make the sleevey bit because I keep getting it wrong. With a little extra help from their fellow workers, the Brits finally start to get the hang of it. Oh and the number of completed blouses steadily increases. You got told off before because here you had to have it perfect and now it's completely perfect. This one's almost finished. 
Mark's one's almost finished, Yazidis one's almost finished, so that'll give us 24, so 12 more. The group continues to work long into the night, finishing another five garments. And with their total now at 29, Mark, Tara and Stacy decide to call it a night. Oh, I'll eat a bit of leg. While Georgina joins Taylor Sanjay for dinner. I am just about to eat heart. Heart? No, right. kidney. kidney. I've just eaten heart. This is kidney. This guy just told me it's cat, but I've been assured that it's chicken, so... Here we go. <laughs> I'm gonna close my eyes in it. Mm. 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 It's good. I am like, I'm a celebrity, get me out of here. Yeah, where they eat like willies and stuff. Okay. Yeah. I'm hardcore. This is where these guys eat and sleep every night. Um, is this what you normally eat? Yeah? Yes. This is what they normally eat every night. Um, it tastes good. Yes. Mm. Many of the workers in this factory are migrants who have travelled thousands of miles from the poorer northern regions of the country. They send almost all the money they earn back to their struggling families. This is your business, isn't it? Uh, this is my business, yes. So you Keen to discover more, to Georgina sits yes, down with Praduman, the English-speaking factory co-owner. Obviously, your workers, they sleep on the floors right. here. Um, do you not sometimes like, feel bad for them for sleeping on the floor? Uh, yes, I do agree with you. But you see, in case they wish to spend more on their luxuries, they are most welcome. It's their money, how they spend it. But the back home, the needs are more. Yeah. That's why they prefer not spending on their luxuries. They prefer sending it back home. Because they all have families to be, su to be supported back home. Mm. And do they get paid for each garment that for they For each make? garment they produce, they get paid. How much do they get for each garment? Uh, each garment has a rate attached to it. It's different for different garments. Okay. It's different per piece. If it's a simple piece, it could go up to like 10 rupees per piece. So um, obviously the workers, if they get in 10 rupees per yeah. item, then that works out at, you know, 8p English money. Yeah. See, the thing I'm struggling with the most is the fact that obviously these things that are being made Obviously, you know, the workers are getting paid like eight pence for them. And say if we take like, I don't know, a normal garment like this. If I wanted to go buy this in a shop, right. then it would probably cost me about 10 pounds. So that's the bit that I'm sort of struggling with, the fact that them, obviously us as, you know, the UK, we're paying people like yourselves to get their workers to make it for us. And then obviously we're paying you lot stupid amounts to do it. Right. I just think that it could be done, you know, so much better. It's just, oh, it just really infuriates me. Richard, too, has been struggling to understand why the workers accept their situation. He decides to quiz 45-year-old Taylor Ali on his circumstances. Do, do you feel you have an opportunity to, to get an education, if you want one, to, uh, to study outside of work? He says, yes, um, I could go to school right now, but I can't afford it. I'm, um, I'd rather pay for my kids' education so that they can have a better life. So you, you can't, there is the opportunity, but you can't afford to, to do it. How much does it cost for, uh, to, to, how, how much does it cost for, to send yourself to school sort of in the evenings or outside of work? I would prefer to earn money and work longer hours and make sure my kids have a better education and get, um, can go further in life. He says my life is pretty much over now. Um, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. Um, there is night school. You don't know how much it costs. You've got a job to try and provide for your kids, but you've already said that having an education would give you a better life. Uh, I, I, don't under, I, I don't understand why he's, not, why he's not tried. Why have you never even looked into going to night school? You could do it outside of work. You could study, study outside of work. You know, it, it might be affordable and you, you might be able to give your children an even better life. 
लड़ाई इसलिए नहीं किया हूँ मैं जैसे रात and after that he wants to go home spend some time with his children um and you know the money earns in the day sometimes they ill he needs to take them to the doctor um so to ensure you know he spends time with them and they have a bright life he hasn't looked into night school it's been i think it's very commendable he's effectively sacrificing his his life for the benefit of his children i mean it may be as a it made me feel perhaps a little bit less harsh i mean perhaps the opportunities don't exist um or the opportunities that are extremely difficult to to come by it's not a case of just sort of hard work but the opportunity it's extremely difficult for these people to get an education because ultimately that's what they need what what he said to to improve their life um i understand now that it that it is more difficult it's been a roller coaster of a day for our brits but tomorrow mr aurora is expecting 36 export quality blouses as things stand he may be very disappointed it's the group's third day of workshop life and with the deadline for their consignment just 4 hours away praduman is back to make sure everyone is awake and ready for work good morning stand to work and on your bed come on please to sleeping no no get up now out please remember it's 12 o'clock is our deadline you still have a lot of work to do so we'll do it to this one as well come on I'll help you come on up here is that clear Lauren clear i can hear it it may be payday today but for some morale is at an all time low oh, i need to toilet again If I'm meant to be a third night, I'm gonna have my credit cards back and I'm booking myself into a hotel. <coughs> I'll stay any longer. Like, why am I working for only sixty pence? So that even less than that. It's ridiculous. I've got no energy. Like, I don't. I do want to go somewhere else. I'm fed up, but I've just. I can't be asked anymore. My heart has just completely gone out of it, especially because. Every single one I've done has been rejected and it's just been crap so I can't be asked. Some of the Indian workers are less than impressed with the Brits attitude. काम नहीं कर रहे हैं जैसे कुछ सो रहे हैं अभी भी सो रहे हैं कुछ लोग आराम कर रहे हैं अगर अच्छे से काम करेंगे तो निकल पाएंगे अदरवाइज तो मुझे लगता है आज का दिन भी पूरा लग जाएगा उसमें. It's a quarter to 9 before the Brits finally emerge and realize that the quicker they work the quicker they can leave it's a beautiful day but i'm stuck inside for the million time walking on to five how i hate this job if we all make one perfect then everything's okay so we just have to do one last one and then we can get out of here but with tara enforcing strict quality control achieving their quota is far from easy rich two of these have been rejected so far two of them are not good no this all needs to be unpicked so that whole right side needs to be done again basically i'd chuck this one in the bin to be honest In total over the last two days I reckon we've made easily like about 50 but it's just so many of them get rejected it's almost like impossible And Tara isn't the only one finding it hard today I didn't really probably realize that would be so different. 20-year-old Stacy is a high street shopping fanatic. I love 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 fashion. I just really enjoy all different types of trends and 
I just love hanging out at the shops and buying the world. Stacey could go out at 8 o'clock in the morning and still be shopping at 8 o'clock at night. This one, I love it. I think it looks really Indian y. She came to India knowing it would be tough. I think I'll be shocked the way people have to work. I don't think it's going to be very glamorous at all. I think we're all going to look like dirt bags, sweating our pants off in the sweatshops. But I don't mind hard work. And despite struggling on the production line last week... Are you ready for the worst pocket you've ever seen in your life? She refused to quit. I don't want to stay, but I know I have to, because they've been teaching me the past three days of their time, so I've just got to try and do a bit more. Auntie. This week, with the pressure on, she's found a novel way of ensuring that her work is up to scratch. Auntie, I've got a plan. Both sleeves, you attach. No. Come on. Bunny, I'm so tired. Please. Remember you said your wife wanted a mascara? Yes. Your wife, mascara. Yeah. She can have mine if you do this. Oh, no! <laughs> yeah. Come on, Bunty! She'll love you forever. Okay. All right? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Definitely not cheating. Absolutely not cheating, because I've done every other blouse myself. They've just helped me, but this one, I'm only asking because it's got to be perfect, else we'll fail. Because we've only got 45 minutes left. So if I do this wrong, then someone's going to have to alter it. I don't think it's cheating. Do you? With their 12 o'clock deadline looming and their target of 36 blouses in sight, the Brits pull together for one final effort. Take a shake. Ali, level one done. It's really got it down to the T. The go. only thing is, Rich, you need to stretch it as you sew it a bit more because it's going to pull. Yeah, we're on 33. I've just got to overlock Marks and Stacey's. That's 35. And then Rich just needs to do that last stitch. And then I have to overlock that, and then we're done. That's just 36. Having hit their target, it's a quick march across town to see their boss, Mr. Aurora. He'll decide whether the blouses are good enough for him to export and how much the group will be paid. But if he thinks there are too few blouses of high street quality, he could send them back to start again. The thing is, I don't want to be in there another night. I'm starting to feel really, really, like, disgusting and itchy. Babe, look at my, look at the state of my That is terrible. Body. I don't think it's... You know what? No one's feeling good. We obviously can't fully immerse ourselves with the workers because we're so used to a different lifestyle. You know, this is what they've always known. Whereas we're not used to that. We're getting an insight, but that doesn't mean we want to get sick as well. Hello. How are you? I'm feeling everybody is feeling asleep. Yeah, we're very tired. I, I told yesterday and I don't stay. Everybody enjoyed doing it? It was a bit of a hard work. Yeah. yeah. At least you know now that uh, how much hard work is involved when you make a garment. Mm. You've either got it or you don't. <laughs> I definitely don't. <laughs> this is the pile of the pieces you have done correctly, and this is the pile of the pieces you have done wrong. We gave you a target of 36 pieces, total you have to give us correct. While you have given us only 15 correct pieces, and into 12 rupees per piece you have earned 180 rupees. 180, 180 rupees total for six persons. Jeez. It means it is 30 rupees only per person. Oh my God. 30 rupees each. 30 rupees each. That's 20p. No, it is 40p. Mr. Aurora? Yes. You know how much uh, 40p what, that can get us in England? A packet of crisps. It used to be a chocolate bar, but now even chocolate bars have gone up. How many do, you, do your workers normally make? They would have made something like 400 rupees. Per person. Uh, which is how much? Four pounds. 400 rupees is something Four like. Four pounds in two days. Uh, five, five pounds. pounds. Five pounds. That's ridiculous. That is pounds. fucking. How many would they have made? Pissed. The way you think about it, though, <laughs> we've done 15 between us. The, the guys that would have been working would have done 20 us. each a day. 
The only thing it looks bad on us is because obviously we done 15 over two days between six of us. <laughs> but we're not professional tailors. Exactly, we're not. Yeah. And to be honest, I will not say you have done a bad job, but still you have done very little. Which is what this, this is 180 rupees. Okay. Spend it like as it is very hard earned money. Thank you very, Thank very much. You very much. Thank you. Yeah. I wouldn't really call it a living wage. I would more rather call it um, a survival wage because of they don't live off that. Like they don't go out for dinner and they don't go out shopping and they don't live with that. They just survive with that. So it make, makes them not die that wage. My heart goes out to them. It really does. It really just makes me feel so selfish. Um, because they're doing it for their families. I mean, most of them are just sending the money back to put their children through education, to put food on the table. I mean, they've basically cut off their own lives to give lives to someone else, and I just think that's amazing. Well, my mum is a seamstress. She makes clothes. She has done since she was younger than me. And um, I don't know, like, when she makes something, I'm like, wow. Like, she made me the most amazing dress for my birthday. And it's like, people here bosh out stuff every day that's just as well made as that. And they get 12 rupees for each one. It just seems really, really unfair, like they're being really cheated. So far, this group of Brits have spent two weeks working in the Indian garment industry experiencing the reality behind how their clothes are made. This is too stressful for me. This place is my idea of hell. But the story of throwaway fashion goes way beyond what they've seen so far. Feeding the factories with the raw materials they need are thousands of cotton laborers who work under tougher conditions for even less pay. If the Brits thought life in Delhi was shocking, nothing will prepare them for what's coming up next. Don't shout at me, please. Don't shout in my face. But before the group sets off on the next stage of their journey, they get to enjoy a few home comforts and spend a night in a hotel. Having slept on a factory floor for two nights, it's a welcome relief. We check in with you. I'm so happy. I nearly cried when we found out we were coming here. Good, I like this room. To get to have a shower and to sleep in a proper bed. Yeah. And I get to watch telly as well. <laughs> oh. You wouldn't believe how much I'm just so grateful of chairs and a toilet and a sink and a tap. It's great. It's just marvellous. I'm really made up. I'm going to have a shower and then I'm going to go have something to eat and then I'm going to have another shower and then I'm going to have another shower and then I'm going to have another shower and some ice cream and then I'll probably go to bed. This is just heaven compared to sleeping on the factory floor. The Brits might be glad to be back in the land of showers and duvets, but they haven't forgotten the workers they've left behind for whom tonight will be just another evening on a factory floor. It kind of hit home today how kind of miserable their existence is. But I just feel so happy to be here. This hotel is so nice. How do I do room service? It's just weird. This is only a, a short drive, like, well, half an hour from where we've been and we've been staying in like squalor, just complete filth. And now we're just in like a lovely building with food and water. They were in the same clothes every day. Yeah. It's quite sad in that sense because they're going to sleep in the same clothes that they've worn the day before and they're waking up and they're just starting work again. I don't think it's right for people to live like that. I think, you know, it's everyone's right to have a shower and have a proper bathroom um, and, and clean facilities and, um, you know, a proper bed. Um, but unfortunately, they don't have it, but they don't know anything better, so 
what can you do? It's 6 a.m. and the six Brits are leaving Delhi to continue on their journey to find out how their clothes are made. The group are traveling to Haryana, an agricultural state 300 miles west of Delhi, to work as cotton pickers. And just like the thousands of migrant workers who flock to the harvest each season, they're traveling third class aboard a packed Indian train. This is just my idea of how the smell is just unbearable. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? <laughs> oh my god, what was that? <laughs> This is the most horrific experience. Yeah, it's really <laughs> not nice. Take me to England. <laughs> A few hours into the journey, Stacy decides to brave the toilet. There's poo there. Oh Lord. <coughs> Sorry. Oh my God. <laughs> but the toilets aren't the only thing upsetting her. None of the cotton pickers aboard this train have ever ventured outside India and the sight of six Brits in their carriage is causing a stir. It's just completely and utterly unnecessary. What well, I don't understand. Fortunately, a rare English-speaking passenger is able to explain the locals' curiosity. I think it's the first time in life uh, whenever I saw any foreigner in the train. So they haven't seen any white people. Well, why, why are you more educated than the other people? So your family had money, money to give you an education? We don't have much money, but I'm working with a, a Australian company and that pay good, good salary. Why can't they get an education? Is there not the opportunity? I know that they don't have a lot of money. They don't have good, good money for the education. There are a lot of population in our country and the income is very low. So not every family can afford a education. They can't even uh, have a proper, proper food. Are, are people in India angry at their government? They are uh, angry but they have no option. What they can do? Can the people not help themselves? Can, is there no way for the poor people to, to help themselves? They can't. They, they can't basically. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've always sort of believed that everyone's faced with a choice in life, but it's coming across more and more now that the more people I'm speaking to that maybe I was wrong initially. I mean, I thought that these people actually had a choice to, uh, you know, to get themselves out of poverty, um, but it kind of appears that actually they don't. Their choice is as limited to you know, work a day, get some food and leave for the next, or just don't work the day and die. Um, and I don't think that's a choice that anybody should have to be faced, should have to be faced with. Seven hours later, the Brits reach the end of the line. Few Europeans have ever ventured this far into Haryana. It's a bit like a ghost town, or something like from the Wild West or something, it feels like. But the cotton plantations are still 22 miles away. So alongside the other migrant workers, they board a local bus. This is quite possibly the worst bus journey I've ever experienced in my life. It's kind of like sitting in one spot and being hit on the head with a frying pan repeatedly. If they thought life in Delhi was tough, the idea of making their clothes in rural India is filling them with dread. Look outside. Look outside. Shit everywhere. I just think it's going to be horrible. You're going to make us sleep in a mud hut, I know it. 
Coming up next time. Get up. Get up fast. The six Brits move into the cotton belt. I've worked about an hour. I've probably picking out for about seven and a half pay. It makes me itch and sneeze and gives me a headache. To take on the most physically challenging job in the fashion business. This job is the most hard work that I've ever done in my life. They'll have to survive on their own. Oh my God, no way am I staying here. And live off the workers' wages. Excuse me, you've just ripped me off. Can we pay you 30 now? No. And then 20 in the morning? Many, many. But when things start to come apart at the seams... Oh. It's an absolute piss take. Who do you think you're speaking to? Well, have a bit of respect. I've never met any boys that, that immature. It gets worse. Great. Our six discover that life at the cutting edge of high street fashion costs more than they could ever imagine. <laughs>